Hello folks, today we're back with another video on end-to-end -end front end testing. Today we have a tool called Tyco. And if you remember from my previous video, we took a look at a tool called Leapwork out of Denmark. And Leapwork is a incredibly powerful tool for the right audience. And that audience uh, is a audience of non-technical testers. So with Leapwork, what you can do is you can have your non-technical QA folks pick up that tool very quickly and be very productive in automating your front end tests. Um, it, it also has some very unique capabilities that you don't see in a lot of other tools. And that includes being able to automate not only web applications, but also desktop applications. Um, and it has lots of built-in capabilities to connect to databases and so on. So it's a very comprehensive tool that allows you to cover a wide gamut of testing scenarios, okay? Tyco, the tool that we're looking at today, on the other hand, um, is very powerful in a very different way and is targeted towards a very different audience. So the audience for Tyco is really a engineering team or a technical test team um, as opposed to a non-technical QA team uh, that doesn't necessarily understand you know, the full complexities of working with DOM or working with code or JavaScript and so on. So we'll see some of the details of, of how this manifests um, and why you would choose one tool over the other, okay? So we're gonna jump right in momentarily. Just take a quick look at the website and the documentation. So most commonly you'll see Tyco uh, bundled together or talked about together with a tool called Gage. And Gage is more of a higher level test orchestration or test organization layer. Um, and if you're familiar with tools like SpecFlow, Gage is very similar. And what you do with Gage is you, you build your high level orchestration uh, on gauge and that is then mapped down to a test running uh, layer either built in C sharp, Java, JavaScript, you name it. Okay. Uh, Tyco on the other hand is very specialized tool that performs the actual running of those tests within the orchestration. And we're going to jump right in, but just give you a quick look. It's a very bare bones website. Um, you know, one of my problems with, you know, I don't want, I don't want it to seem like I'm detracting from Tyco too much. Um, one of my problems with Tyco is the documentation is really, you know, not well organized, you know, even within the sections, for example, there is some organization here, but even the commands, for example, aren't alphabetical. So if you're looking for a specific command, you kind of have to hunt for it. Um, and it's, uh, you know, when you get into one of these commands, for example, the documentation is pretty decent, but there's no global navigation. So there's no left-hand navigation of the different commands. You have to kind of jump back and forth to keep multiple tabs open. Um, so I think the documentation could use a little bit of work. It's not necessarily the most user-friendly, okay? So with that out of the way, we're gonna talk more about this in a little bit. Some of the strengths and weaknesses of Tyco, we'll get back to that, but let's jump right in and take a look at how we work with Tyco. Okay, so the scenario that we're going to walk through is very similar to the scenario we walked through in my uh, Leapwork video. And if you haven't seen that video, I'm gonna leave a link below. You can click it and watch that video. You know, again, see which is the right tool for your team, okay? So you can work with Tyco in many different ways. You can start from writing the raw JavaScript into a JavaScript file. Or you can do it the way I like to do it, which is to work with this uh, interactive command line. Okay, so you install the command line tools uh, through NPM. And once you have that, you can just come to the command line and invoke Tyco. Okay, and this will bring up the interactive command line. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through basically these commands and work with them through this interactive command line uh, to perform our automation run. All right, so let's try it out, okay? All right, so the first thing we want to do is open a browser. So this is the open. So you can see here, if you tap twice, it'll show you the commands that are available. 
Okay, open browser, and we want to ignore certificate errors. Okay, true. So if you're doing local development, you will want to ignore these certificate errors because your certificate will certainly be uh, just a local development certificate. All right. And you can see this opens an instance of Chromium. So when you download and install the Tycle tools through NPM, it will also install uh, Chromium um, along with the full Tycle package. Okay. So this brings us to one of the other limitations of the tool is that uh, Tyco, unlike Leapwork, you know, isn't really well suited for cross-browser compatibility testing uh, because it, it was built initially from the ground up to work with Chrome um, and has since been ported to support Firefox as well, uh, but it does not support, for example, Internet Explorer um, and never will, right? So if your goal is to do cross-browser testing, and especially if you need to support legacy browsers, right? This is probably not the tool set for you, okay? All right, so let's get started. We're going to go to our web page. All right, and you can see it's really nice because I can continue to interact with the command line and see my results in the browser in the background, okay? Now, once I have my application loaded, we want to put our username in here, and this is done with the write command. So we're going to write the username PA, and we're going to write it into, okay, I'm going to try this username, right? So you can see here, this is really the, one of the really interesting parts of Tyco, is that unlike a tool like Selenium or Cypress, which requires you to use a very precise selector. Tyco lets you use a very abstract uh, set of selectors to navigate the elements in the page. Okay, so we're not using a specific ID or a specific um, XPath. Uh, what we're doing here is using a very abstract term, username, and it seems to have selected the right user input, right? So let's try out the password. Okay, so let's see if this works. And we can see this actually did not work. Um, it's almost as if the first run was kind of a fluke. And what's interesting is that even though there is a password field down here and the password text, um, it's selecting the entirely wrong input, right? Um, and, and what's also interesting, in my opinion here, is it didn't throw an error, right? So it, it, it didn't find this uh, target, right? Uh, but it also didn't give us an error, okay? Now, if we look at the actual DOM, okay, this field down here actually has the ID and the name of the password. So it's quite interesting that it didn't select uh, it didn't have a strategy to select this field, this text field, okay? Um, let's try some different strategies and see if we can get it to work, right? Um, right? Okay. And of course, we can definitely use a direct jQuery strategy, okay? So we're going to use a jQuery selector here. Okay, so let's see. So this definitely works, right? Uh, but I think this defeats the purpose a little bit because now you have to know what this DOM structure looks like to use the tool. Um, and kind of takes away uh, you know, some of the power of the tool, right? Um, what we want to see is let's try a different strategy. Okay, I'm going to delete this. Let's try a different strategy. Okay. Into... Let's see if we specify text box, okay? And we put, oh, so it just found the first text box in this case and put the password in. And that's also not quite what we want. So let's see, how about this?
Okay, I did hit enter. So you can see it's, it's churning away, doing something in the background. And we get an error here that the text field with the label password was not found. Okay, so this gives us a little bit of a hint um, in that it's trying to find this using the label perhaps, right? Um, but interestingly enough, it still did not hit our password input field, all right? So let's try this, okay? Into text box below And there we go. So this brings us to a very interesting set of uh, strategies or selectors within Tyco. And these are these positional selectors, okay? So if you look at the Tyco documentation, there's of course your normal jQuery dollar selector, uh, but we have all of these proximity or positional selectors down here, to left of, to right of, above, below, and near, okay? And we're gonna take a look at these because I think these are really, really interesting a uh, really interesting way of approaching how to select elements on the page without having to use uh, very explicit uh, very explicit CSS or DOM selectors or uh, expat selectors, okay? So now we're gonna do this, click login. Okay, and you can see we did click login but it clicked this text login, right? We actually want to click this button login, okay? So we have to tell Tyco we're looking for the button that has the text login. And look at that, it grabbed the button and clicked it, all right? So I think that's very cool because you can do, you know, if you look at what we've done so far, uh, we could have accomplished this flow without knowing anything uh, about the DOM structure of the page, right? And to me, this is, you know, a very productive aspect of this tool. Um, I can work through it without having to open up the dev tools, right? Now, let's, let's go through the same flow that we did with, uh, with LeapWork, right? We're going to do a document distribution in the system. Okay, so we're going to click portal actions, and that's this text right up here. Okay, then we're going to click upload site documents. Okay, then we're going to click Okay, very good. And then we're going to click Okay. Now, this is an interesting one because this is a this control that we're looking at here, this is a select to control. So, if we were to actually look at the DOM structure of this control, it's a mishmash of divs and inputs and hidden selects. Um, and all sorts of things, right? So the question is, what is the behavior that we're going to get if we just click uh, this text, okay? This text could be a span, it could be within a div. Let's take a look, okay? So look at that. It actually brought up uh, our input field, which is perfect, this is exactly what we want, right? Now, we're gonna type in our value just like we did with leap work, okay? We are going to write because we are already focused on it. And we're going to press enter. Perfect. Now, this control down here is also a, uh, a complex control down here. Um, you can see here, I can, I, can, I can start typing. It has the matching. Um, so the question again is how do we get, you know, let's focus out of here. Now the question is how do we type in our value into that text box, okay? So if we were still focused here, for example, we could try to do a tab, 
but let's say in this case we're not focused here how are we going to get into this text box okay um, so let's try what we did before with the password right um, write Canada okay into text box below countries okay so let's see if this will work so that's pretty impressive that's pretty impressive uh, because this this it could have picked this countries and found that there's no text box below it but it correctly selected this countries and placed the text below it okay now we're going to select the document type here okay click okay uh, or let's do yeah why not all right click okay and likewise here we have a control um, a complex control not just a text box but let's focus out of here and let's see if we can get our text into it right uh, Canada 200 into text box okay and we're going to use a different selector here to right of do right of target to sites all right so let's see what happens here got it okay so let's press enter so you can see this is really powerful right we've gotten to this point without having to you know know any bit of the structure of the dom or the id of any of the fields um or any you know anything like that we can just use what we're seeing on the on the ui and treat it as if it were you know quote unquote black box testing right uh we'll talk about some of the benefits and some of the some of the issues with this you know in a little bit uh but let's go down and attach our file okay so now we want to attach and i've already got the file path uh written out here Okay, so we're going to attach to, and here we have to use file field, okay? And the question is, where is the input file field here, okay? So if we, if we were to, uh, if we were to actually click this and add the file, right? We'll just add a, uh, this JavaScript file here, it doesn't matter. Okay, if we add the file, it seems like perhaps the actual file input is here. It could be hidden, right? We don't know. So what we can do is rather than rather than to the right, to the left, uh, we can use near. Okay, so this proximity selector near. Whoops. We want to do near add file right so let's see if we can find the actual file field file field uh, near this add file text okay look at that okay so there's actually a hidden there's actually a hidden uh, file input that's near this add file and we attached our file to it okay what we want to do now is change the document name so we want to uh, click okay click uh, text box near document name okay all right so we're focused into our text box now this is where it's a little bit less satisfying than working with leap work for example um, what you'll find is that you cannot send uh, what are considered operating system level key combinations 
to this API. So control A, for example, to select all of the text and delete it in one go. We can't send that, okay? We can try, let's see, right? Press uh, CTRL plus A, let's see. No, right, it doesn't understand this command. Uh, if you look at the documentation, it talks about CTRL dash A, let's see. It also doesn't understand this command, right? Um, so there's no way for us to just select all of the text. We actually have to press and send an array of backspace. Okay. All right. So now we've cleared our text. We can type in our name. We can uh, click. We can write. Uh, 2020 FDA 1572 Tyco 001. Okay. Perfect. And now what we want to do is we want to click this upload button here. Okay. Okay. And you can see again, we did click upload, but we clicked up here. We want to hit this button. So we want to click button upload perfect All right so now that we've done this distribution the next question we're not going to do the login and log out uh, what I want to show you is if we come back into this application for the end user you know what does it look like when we do something like try to traverse a table and find the correct row so if you remember from my leap work video when we do one of these distributions we could end up with multiple tasks for the user and those tasks could be assigned to different contexts or different scopes right uh, the user has to provide that document potentially for multiple scopes and what we want to be able to do is to select the correct scope all right so we're going to start this over in another browser Okay, and dot Tyco open browser, ignore certificate errors, true. Okay, go to Okay, and what we want to do is we're going to log in as a totally different user here. All right, so we've logged in as Peter, and you can see here, uh, this is the distribution that we just performed, right? And we've received it. But you can see below, this user also has multiple distributions for this. Uh, let's take a look at this one, for example. Uh, 2020.3 protocol signature page. And you can see it's assigned to two different scopes, right? So we have 110 and 115. Now, if we're doing a distribution like this and a test, we may want to iterate through these, or we may want to execute a completion scenario on a very specific instance of this task, right? So let's say we wanted to select this task, right? Uh, I'm going to copy this text out. And let's try this. Okay, so if we, if we just click on this text, Let's see which one we get, okay? We get the instance for site 110, right? Because this is the first one that appears on the page, right? Now, the question is, how do we get the one, uh, how do we get this one with 115, right? With site 115. So in LeapWork, for example, um, there's a couple ways you can do this. One is there's, an, there's a 
uh, implicit iteration through the selection mechanism where it will implicitly iterate through each of these elements and we can match by the specific text that says 115, okay? Within Tycho, we don't have really have that capability, okay? There's no implicit iteration. We have to perform an explicit iteration if we want to do it that way, okay? There is this table cell selector which does allow us to inspect a specific column or and a specific row, right? But is this, you know, do we really want to tell it where to look, right? Um, you know, is this really the right solution, right? Now, if we come back here and look at these proximity selectors, you know, it might be worth trying out this two left of, two right of, right? Or potentially even the near, uh, to see if we can locate that 115, okay? So let's give it a shot, right? So this time we're going to click the same link, but we're going to say uh, click this link with uh, to the right of. We're going to click when this link is to the left of, okay? To the left of. To left of. Let's see, 115, okay? So again, there's two records with the same exact name assigned to two different scopes, right? If we, if we don't specify any other selector, it automatically defaults to the first one on the page, but we actually want to click this one. Okay, so let's see what happens. Ready? Look at that. So we did select the right one, right? So we use this two left of 115 and it, it identified the collect, correct row and click the correct link, okay? So this is really powerful, right? Because for building this very complex scenario, um, we did not have to know any of the DOM structure aside from, you know, positional left, right, top, bottom, uh, above, below uh, to get through this test case. Um, I think for me, this this is a really, really productive tool if you're comfortable working with a command line um, and you're comfortable, you know, working with a rudimentary JavaScript, okay? Now, this does have certain challenges, of course. You know, number one, for example, is what if you're trying to do a scenario with iteration, okay? Um, in leap work, there's an implicit iteration mechanism when you perform uh, element matching where it will implicitly iterate through the elements that are matched until it finds your criteria of what you're looking for, okay? In a tool like Tyco, we actually have to iterate it explicitly, right? So if we were to take a look at this page here, let's say the item we're looking for is not on the first page, we would have to potentially have logic to click next and then iterate through the next set of items and click next again, okay? Uh, to do that, we're going to have to write some code, all right? Now, the really neat thing about Tyco is that we can take this test run, for example, and if we do this, dot .code, C users, We can export. We can export this run to a JavaScript file. So let's take a look. All right. So here's our JavaScript file. We'll bring it in here, and you can see here it has converted. It has converted our run into a set of JavaScript commands. All right. Now, you can see it also keeps the commands. You know, it also keep failed commands. It'll keep the commands uh, that that we didn't want. But it's very easy to come in here and just delete these. Right, we just delete that, um, and we have our commands. Now, how do we run this again? Okay, we're just gonna save this after we've deleted that. Okay, and we're going to exit here. Okay, and we're going to run our exported JavaScript. All right, so let's run our command. Okay. All right, perfect. So you can see it actually ran our command, but it ran it in headless mode. This is what you would expect to do, for example, 
uh, if you were running this on a automation server or as part of your build process. So let's take a look at how we can run this in uh, with the client in the UI, okay? Okay, so if we want to run this and watch it, we have our same command and we type observe. And this will start the same run, okay, with a three second pause between each of the steps so you can really see what's happening, right? Beautiful, really beautiful, okay? So that's really cool. I think, uh, you know, I think for, for folks who are more technical, who are comfortable writing very rudimentary JavaScript, uh, this tool is incredibly, incredibly productive, okay? In some sense, you could say it's even more productive than leap work. But I think the challenge with Tycho and the delta between Tycho and leap work is that you are going to have people who are simply not comfortable working within the command line, um, who are going to be difficult to train to work in this mode, right? Um, and of course, like we talked about, for example, if you needed to do iteration, you would have to come in here and actually write that iteration logic in JavaScript, right? And I think the, the moment that you switch from this context to this context, you're going to lose a lot of the people who would have been really comfortable working in leap work, okay? So this is a very simple use case. And obviously, as you get into more complex test scenarios, the question is, you know, how do you drive those test scenarios with external data sets? Could be a CSV, could be a database connection, uh, could be a JSON text file, right? Um, we're going to take a look at how we hook that up. But it's important to understand the distinction between a tool like Tycho versus a tool like Leapwork. Okay, I think this is where the folks that are, you know, your non-technical QA folks aren't going to be very comfortable working with this compared to working with a tool like Leapwork where they can just drag and drop and bring in an Excel file and parse the values from that Excel file right away, okay? Uh, with Tycho, you have the full power of Node and you can bring in any sort of modules you want to work with the file system, to work with the database, to work with FTP, um, and so on. But at that point, you're going to have to know a bit of rudimentary uh, JavaScript and interact with these modules, okay? So let's take a look. Um, in this case, we're gonna try to parameterize this file. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go ahead and create a input file here, new uh, text document. Okay, so we have our file here, and we are going to open it up here. Okay. So we have our header row here, username, password, and we're gonna put this here, PLSA, and, okay, and it's password, and save our input file, right? Now to use, to, to consume this, right? We will now have to import the packages necessary to number one, open the file, read the file into, uh, into the code. And then number two is to parse it as CSV, okay? So we're gonna do this, const, uh, const fs file system equals require fs. Const CSV equals require uh, CSV parser, okay? So we're gonna bring in our packages for the file system and for CSV, and we're gonna try to load this, right? fs.create read stream from input.csv, inputs.csv, and pipe to CSV. <coughs> dot on data row 
And what we're going to do, we're just going to log it, okay? Console.log, we're going to log the row. And dot on end. And okay. So what we're gonna do now, we're just gonna we're just gonna run it with the parser. Okay. And see how we how we ingest this file and how we can use the values in the file. Okay. So again to review, we have to import the package for uh, interacting with the file system. We have to import the package to work with the CSV. And once we have that, we create a stream to read the CSV file. We pipe it to the CSV parser and we handle the events from the CSV par parser uh, for each data row and for reaching the end of the file. All right, so let's save this. And we're gonna run this again, okay? All right, and this should just return and log the output. In, in fact, we don't have to observe because we're returning immediately. Um, and in fact, because we don't open the browser, we can't close the browser. So let's save that. All right, perfect. So you can see it read our CSV file in, and interestingly enough, right, it provides each row, it generates each row as a JSON object, right? So if we wanted to, we could print console.log row dot username. Okay, so let's check that out. Nice. All right, so if we want to iterate over those rows now and execute our logic, it seems very natural that we're going to want to update this event handler function here. And in fact, if you update this function here, you're not going to get the results you expect. You're going to get errors. And the reason is because this is going to execute concurrently. And what we really want is we want it to execute serially so that we don't try to open browser twice um, and process both rows concurrently, okay? So what we actually wanna do is we wanna capture the users. And in this call here, we want to push this into our array, okay? And where we actually want to do our handling and processing of each of the rows is at the very end here, once we've processed each row already. We're going to take this and put it into a loop, okay? Now you may be wondering why I'm not using a user dot for each. What you'll find is that if you use the user dot for each, you're going to have the same problem. Is that the API is going to uh, invoke the open browser twice concurrently, and that's going to give you an exception. All right. So what we actually want to do is we want to use a for const, okay, user of users, and we're going to paste our actions right in here, okay. Now, what you'll find is that if we run this right now, we are going to get an error because we can't have these awaits uh, inside of a non-async function, okay? So we're going to have to declare this async, okay, uh, to have these awaits. Now, let's try to run this and let's see what happens, okay? So if we run this, you can see this fails immediately uh, because we still have a problem here. And you can really see the challenges of using this tool for non-technical resources who aren't familiar with JavaScript. And even if you want to do something as simple as iteration like this, you have to be very comfortable uh, writing asynchronous JavaScript. So what we actually have to do here is that we have to, we want to ensure that all of these operations complete before we move on to the next iteration. Um, and to do that, we have to await this whole block. Okay, we have to await this whole block and put it into another function. Okay, so we're gonna take this and 
put it here, okay? And we need to now invoke this function, all right? And save that. Now let's run this again. So you can see we still have an error here. And this is because it doesn't like this finally block at the end. Uh, we actually have to take this out of here, all right? And if we take this out, let's see here. Okay, we have our run now uh, being driven by the CSV file, okay? Now, what you're gonna see here is actually this test case will ultimately fail. And the reason is really simple. We'll, we'll see what happens here, okay? Okay, now, so far so good, but we can't open browser again uh, for the next run because we didn't close browser, right? Now, the problem is that if you put close browser here, this will also fail uh, because at that point, the Tyco session is over, right? So what you really need to do in this scenario is you have to basically rebuild your test case um, so that it will, it will log the user out and log the user back in uh, or potentially use incognito windows instead. Uh, but definitely you can't just redirectly, you know, indirectly uh, reuse the uh, reuse your test case, okay? You have to basically rebuild it to make sure it's going to operate within the flow uh, of how Tyco wants you um, to work with the API, all right? So you can see the complexity of Tyco ramps up really quickly um, for very basic flows. You know, you could argue that even a semi-technical person uh, potentially could have an easier time working with Tyco because you don't have to know anything about the DOM. You don't have to know anything about uh, element IDs. You don't have to know anything uh, about XPath. You can pretty much get away a lot of the time using the proximity selectors and just a very, very rudimentary JavaScript, okay? But the moment you start to do any sort of, um, any sort of com complex scenarios, you know, like iteration, uh, reading in files, writing files, connecting to databases, um, connecting to FTP, for example, or a file system, you have to drop into JavaScript. And that does make it considerably more complex. And, you know, you can see in this scenario, you have to know, um, you know, you have to be comfortable with JavaScript to be able to uh, build these types of scenarios that would otherwise be really straightforward in leap work. Okay. And again, these tools are really designed for different audiences. Um, so if you were to look at a tool like Tyco without looking at some of the more complex scenarios like this, you would be fooled into thinking that, hey, it's even easier than leap work. Uh, but I think it's actually, it, it's actually quite challenging for some of these scenarios that in leap work are quite easy, like reading in a CSV file, right? Um, and then using that to drive your test cases, okay? Now, if you're looking at Tyco, certainly you're also looking at other tools, for example, uh, Selenium, Catalan, or even Cypress, okay? And one of the things about, uh, one of the things about this tool that I think is really interesting compared to Cypress is that it does have the ability to work with multiple tabs and multiple windows. Now, why is, why is it important to be able to work with multiple tabs? So if you're building an application, for example, where you are doing some action in one application that would, for example, generate an email and you want to see it or test it in, the, in a different application where you're receiving your email, you might wanna have two, both tabs open and just be able to switch back and forth as opposed to logging out, logging in, logging out, and logging in. So let's take a look at how this works here. Okay, we're gonna start the command line again. Okay, so we're gonna start this up again. Okay, and we're going to 
go to Okay. Now what we're going to do is open another tab. And you can see we can do open tab. And we're going to open another tab to Okay. So really straightforward, right? Now what we can do as part of this test is that we can switch between the tabs, right? So again, for example, if I'm doing an action that generates an email, uh, I would open up an email email client here, uh, email application here, and go into the my other application, perform the action, and then switch back, check my email, and then I can switch back and forth, okay? So in this case, I can use this switch to, okay? And I'm gonna try this, right? This is the title of my tab, let's see what happens. Okay, so it says there's no tab matching sign in, right? And very clearly we can see up here it says sign in, uh, so it should match. But if we take a look at the API for this guy, okay, we should be able to match it by a regular expression, right? Um, so let's try that. Let's see. All right, very nice. So you can see if you're working with Cypress, you, in this type of scenario, you would have to log out, uh, log into the other application, perform some action, log out, log back into the original application. Whereas with Tyco, because you can manipulate multiple windows and multiple tabs, you have the ability or, or at least the option um, to open multiple tabs and then switch between those tabs, right? Uh, I think this is particularly important if you're doing end-to-end -end testing with a modern application that has some sort of real-time component. Because with the real-time component, what you want to see is that, you know, a real-time component in a single-page application, what you want to see is that as you perform an action on one side of the application, in a different location in the application, you're going to get a real-time update um, and actually see that happening, right? Now, there's a lot of other cool features of Tyco that we're not going to go through today. Um, we're going to, you know, point you to the documentation. Of course, some of the more interesting uh, aspects of this, for example, is the ability to intercept requests. So what this allows you to do is perform some level of mocking within your scripts. Instead of actually interacting with the back end, you can intercept the request to a specific URL and send back a mock object. So this is really great if you're building the front end and you don't have your back end data services yet, or if you're testing this independently of your back end data services and you're just using a mock data set, you can fully mock out your single page application um, and not actually have to connect it to any back end services, right? So really powerful tool in my opinion, uh, but you can see it's 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 completely aimed at a different audience. Um, you know, you can make the case that if you pair this with Gauge, maybe your testers can, you know, your non-technical testers uh, can be empowered to use this. Uh, but again, you need to have the, you know, it does it involve more work from your engineering team if you don't have dedicated QA engineers uh, to write these test cases, because you can see here, even a simple for loop iterating over a list of users is non-trivial to accomplish. Um, in Tyco. All right, so some closing thoughts on Tyco. Um, I think this is a really interesting tool. It allows a development team. It's, it's really, in my opinion, geared more towards developers or dedicated uh, test engineers that are comfortable coding JavaScript. Um, and I think for this audience, you know, it's incredibly productive, even more productive than leap work, okay? Um, however, there are some aspects to consider whether they're good or bad. Um, so a very simple example is the ambiguity with which you're selecting some of these elements. With a tool like Selenium, for example, you are very explicitly selecting this login button using a, uh, using a CSS selector or using an XPath selector. Uh, DOM selector, and the 
that lack of ambiguity, that explicitness can be very beneficial in the sense that it insulates you from changes in the layout of the application, right? At the same time, that's also a dual edged sword because it means that even small changes in your DOM layout um, could break your test cases, okay? Now it's for you to decide whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, right? Now, if you're evaluating this against a tool um, like Cypress, for example, there are some additional gaps. You know, as you saw, a lot of the interaction with this is purely from the command line. And what's kind of nice about uh, Cypress is it is a more mature tool set with a larger audience. Um, and it does have some really nice capabilities. For example, the ability to replay your test cases and have the DOM at each step of the way um, and be able to uh, interrogate the DOM if you need that, right? Um, I think the other big gap with this tool is, of course, there's no support for Internet Explorer. So if you're if your application has to support legacy applications, you know, even IE 11, for example, um, you're not going to you're going to have to have another tool to be able to do that kind of testing, right? Um, if you want to work with other browsers like Safari, for example, it's the same story. You're going to need to have a different tool set to be able to test uh, across that browser. So certainly this tool set, Tyco, uh, has its limitations in that it's not really uh, designed to meet the same exact use cases as a uh, much more comprehensive tool set like LeapWork, right? Uh, this tool set, to me, seems like it's better suited for development teams that want to perform end-to-end -end testing of key scenarios um, to allow them to move fast, right? And I think this is really good for, for that type of scenario where you're moving fast because it doesn't require explicit selectors based on ID or XPath selection. Um, so what that allows you to do is it allows you to make changes to the user interface. You can move buttons around, um, you can move, you can change the structure of your DOM and not be punished for it because your selectors no longer work, right? Uh, but again, you know, this can be also be a dual edged sword because in some cases, if you, if you do change that DOM, you perhaps you actually do want your test to fail because the button is now in the wrong place, right? Or displaying completely incorrectly, okay? Uh, so again, Tyco is a very interesting tool. Um, you know, Gauge, I think, is a good layer on top of it, but uh, for an engineering team, for a development team, uh, you probably only, need, probably only need Tyco, okay? Um, and you don't really need the Gauge aspect of it. And whether it's the right tool for you compared to Cypress or compared to LeapWork, depends on what you're trying to accomplish, um, but definitely a very interesting tool to try out, all right?